Hello and welcome to Oakwood by Sea Churches, reading the Bible together. My name is Dom, I'm the pastor of the church, and it's great that you can join me as we continue to read 1 Samuel. Uh, we have got to chapter 15, and by this point, Samuel has anointed Saul, the Lord's choice for the first king over his people. Uh, well, really, the Lord himself is the king, and that's said throughout, and that's what the people were meant to recognise. And Saul, he started well, but pretty soon after, he, or at least in the narrative, that is, uh, he did what he shouldn't have done. He grew impatient and he made these sacrifices that were for Samuel to do. And also he was putting heavy burdens on the army for no apparent reason other than his own pride and his own, yeah. So <clears throat> all that's to say is as we get to the heading of chapter 15, that's why we read the Lord rejects Saul as king. Let's pray and then we'll dive in. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you have set your king in Zion. And he's not like any other ruler that we've ever known in, on this planet. He is unique. He is your holy one. And he is perfect. Father, we want to know more of him. We want to know more of Jesus and we want to be more like him. So please speak to us now by your word and in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So here we are, chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. With stuff going on between Israel and Gaza at the moment, this really does hit a nerve, doesn't it? Uh, I'm not going to do a deep dive into an answer to this, um, this command, but what is really important is this is a very specific context. This isn't a license for, um, for Israel today or for Christians today, certainly not, to apply this to mean that we need to violently attack others and commit genocide. This is a very specific context, there's a very specific reason given, and there is an enormous amount of context to uh, inform what this command is saying. But uh, now is not the time I'm going to dive into it. But that's what is commanded, this total destruction. From the Lord, through Samuel, to Saul. Verse 4, so Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. And there we see again, that it's a very specific context for a very specific reason. Verse 7, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. What did the Lord say? Do not spare anyone. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. What did the Lord say? Spare nothing. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Ha. Sorry about that. <laughs> Verse 10. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. 
I regret that I've made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not car carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honour and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, The Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, What then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle too, sacrificed to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I, viola I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught hold of the hem of his robe and it tore. Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbours, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being, that he should change his mind. And you might think, uh, if you wanted to play the devil's advocate, I don't know why you'd ever <laughs> kind of want to uh, have that title in that way, but you know what I mean. Um, earlier, we just read that the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king, but then we read now that he's not a human being, that he should change his mind. And there's a, a couple of seeming uh, contradictions that if you really wanted to uh, try to twist it um, in that way, then you can make it seem that way. But the Lord is consistent in that he is the king and that he wants uh, what is, well, I mean, yeah. And so he is on that path and he is king. He is uh, working out his uh, whole plan of redemption for all of the world and nothing's going to get in that way. Uh, and so, yeah, he, he's not changing his mind from that. He is faithful. Uh, and in all this, it's, it's not to say that the Lord made Saul fool. It's, but it's saying that through Saul's own choice of rejecting the word of the Lord, the Lord still works his purposes out. Hopefully I'm making some sense and it's relevant to this, um, but maybe we should just keep on reading. But what is striking here, because we might say, well, come on, Saul just slipped up. It was such a trivial matter. And why is the Lord coming down on him like a ton of, ton of bricks, taking away his kingship. Well, there's a couple of things. Uh, 
we are, we must try as best we can to calibrate our morality to the living God. He is good. He is life. He is light. He is faithful. He is good. He's righteous. And so if we think we know better than the Lord, then maybe <laughs> maybe that's the arrogance that is worse than the evil of idolatry, you know, because we're making ourselves out to be a god. Um, so, yeah, we need to recalibrate uh, our measure of what is right and wrong to do with the Lord. And in fact, through this mini-sermon, the truth comes out that although Saul gave it a good spin, saying, well, he saved the best reserved for the Lord for a sacrifice, is actually he gave in to the people. He wasn't doing what the Lord told him to do because he wanted to do what the people told him to do more. And so he can't be king. He can't be king in the biblical sense chosen by the Lord, if he's going to choose to do what people say rather than what God says. And Jesus brings out, uh, he, he quotes, doesn't he? The Lord desires mercy and not sacrifice, which has an echo here, doesn't it? How obedience is better than sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. And that's really important in the Christian life. Because the temptation is do what you want, but make up for it in some ablution, some like some sacrifice to pay that debt off. But as long as the scale scales are weighed up by the end, then you're right, you know, it's like a, a whole system of works, but in terms of the Christian life, not in terms of entering the Christian life, but continuing the Christian life to say something along the lines of, well, I'm, I'll, I won't listen to the Lord there, but I'll make up for it uh, with this great show of devotion to the Lord. But it doesn't work like that. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And if we're not obeying the Lord, if we're dead set against him and his ways, then he's not going to receive our worship. He's going to turn a deaf ear to us. So it's twice as bad, which is exemplified in the um, characteristics of the Pharisees of Jesus' day. Okay. And another thing to note is that the kingship has been taken from Saul. He's been rejected as king. And so his repentance now should look like him taking the crown off his head. And by doing so, he would spare his soul. It's, it's to now accept the word of the Lord that's been spoken to him, to submit to that word of the Lord, and there find life. It comes through this humility it comes through also accepting that the Lord has chosen one of his neighbours. And he needs to submit to that anointed one as the Lord's king. That's what repentance looks like in Saul. And there is hope. There's always hope. Because you might wonder, well, is Saul supposed to be a picture of a hopeless case? There's, there's always hope in Jesus. <clears throat> but it's a narrow path. It requires this inconvenient um, repentance, turning away, turning to. So he says, I have sinned. Seems like he's owned up. And then he goes in verse 30, but please honour me before the elders of my people and before Israel come back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with the Lord and Saul worshipped the Lord. Yeah, I don't know whether that's helpful. But anyway, verse 32, then Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. 
that guy came to him in chains. There's a footnote there, which I want to know what it says. The meaning of the Hebrew for this phrase is uncertain, in chains. And he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Um, um, that is an important point for the context of why there was this command for total destruction of the Amalekites. It's because here is the truth. Agag had been uh, acting violently and, yeah, and all this. Um, and someone has also, so there is this great principle, isn't there? The golden rule, do to others as you would have done to yourself. But that is also a principle of God's judgment. His perfect justice is that the measure that we use against for others is the measure that will be used against us. And here it is that Agag has um, meted out violence and evil on others. And now his time for judgment has come. But another point which has been pointed out to me is what Samuel says to Agag <coughs> in this total destruction because it's a, like a technical term um, utterly devoted to destruction, that kind of idea, which comes up a lot more in the book of Joshua and Judges. And yeah, but um, it's about the conquest of Canaan more than anything. And this is a spillover of that situation. Um, but notice that even when that it's said to be these people groups like the Amalekites are said to have been completely destroyed. They're not. <laughs> They're not. Um, and one reason is here, as you, Samuel says to Agag, your, as your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. So that's, yeah, that's saying that both highlighting Agag's cruelty, but also the mercy of the Lord in the Agag's mother is spared and presumably more. And what's more is if you, I can't, I don't have the specific references, but the Amalekites um, continue on in the story of the Bible. They're not completely destroyed, despite what you might think from this passage. So <clears throat> there we go. Verse 34, then Samuel left for Ramah, but Saul went up to his home in Gibeah of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Um, one way to get around this seeming paradox of the Lord not changing his mind, but here now also regretting um, a way of getting around it cannot be to say that the Lord is impersonal. Because he is the, the fount and creator, the author of all personality. All personality is from him and true personality is found in him. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So you can't cut out any notion of emotion from the living God because we think that's underneath him. No. When it says the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel, I see that as more than we could ever regret doing something ourselves. But that, but that isn't to say that the Lord didn't know that this was going to be the way. It's like Jesus, as, as another aside, like Jesus was at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus and he knew exactly what he was going to do in a moment, raise his friend back from the dead. And yet in that moment before, he wept. And Jesus felt more compassion than anyone else. He is the man. We were made in his image. So let's not try and wriggle out of the dichotomy here, or the seeming dichotomy. That uh, by saying that emotion is underneath the living God. He is, yeah. Right, uh, okay. 
it's a heavy chapter and it's also a, a chapter that people turn to a fair amount because of um yeah because of all of the, all of the violence and it's used as a test case for that right let's keep on reading chapter 16 the lord said to samuel how long will you mourn for saul since i've rejected him as king over israel so that's like Saul should have accepted the word of the Lord and taken the crown off his head and Samuel should have uh, just believed that what the Lord has said is true and also part of the message was that the Lord hasn't just rejected Saul as king but also chosen another that Samuel is moping about. So the Lord says to Samuel, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul hears, if Saul hears about it, he will kill me. And there's this ripple effect, isn't there, of sin, of distrust and doubt. Like Saul rejects the word of the Lord and cares more about what other people think. And now it's having an effect on Samuel, of all people. He's scared of Saul rather than the fear of the Lord. Like if the Lord is for us, who can be against us and all that stuff. But And yet, and yet, of course, it's easy to say, isn't it? But then when we get to a situation, it's harder to actually put into practice. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. There's, <laughs> there's something about this um, this zeitgeist in our culture today, this fear, well, it's more of like a terror of church and of God and of, um, and of preachers, you know, it's like fight or flight comes into action and people think that sometimes they think they couldn't come into a church building, they'll be smitten by God the moment they step over the door, doorway. There is something about that in many people today. There is, <laughs> the Lord wants people to come and trust and find life and, yeah. <clears throat> anyway, verse five, Samuel said, yes, in peace, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel said, saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Don't know what it was about Eliab, but Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else. He looked like the king. And that is the paradigm that Samuel is looking for, isn't it? To fit into someone who looks like a king, a man's man. So Samuel saw Eliab. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. That's our memory verse as a church, whilst we're reading all this. It's really important. Um, he didn't consider the outward appearance of Saul, but he looked at the heart. Um, that makes sense of, well, that makes sense of Eli and his sons, and it makes sense of Samuel and his sons, and it makes sense of Saul and his sons, and it makes sense of David and his sons, and it tells us about Jesus as well. But there's also profound application for ourselves, isn't it, knowing that people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And I don't want to get sidetracked too much, but the heart isn't just about emotions. And it's, it is the control centre of our whole lives. It's like the subconscious. It, it, it does have the emotions, but it's also thought processes. It's the mind. 
and the, one of the go-to um, scriptures that I go to explain it is when Mary, after the nativity story, says that Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. She pondered them in her heart. Ponder is the place of pondering, decision-making, and all of that and more. So it's not just saying, like, yeah, anyway, but the, the Lord sees like our motivations and our thinking. He knows the internal monologue in our minds. Verse 8, <clears throat> then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then made Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. And it's comical, isn't it? The run to the family. The, the Lord loves to choose the weak, forgotten, but sidelined to show that it's his power at work. And it was true in Saul to a degree, wasn't it? He was from Benjamin, he was of a small tribe, and he recognised that he was nothing. But then it was when he thought he was something, he truly did become worthless. But it's David, it's uh, this young chap, as will be described of him, he is a man after the Lord's heart. <clears throat> Verse 14, Now the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. There's a footnote on that word evil. It says, or and a harmful spirit, which comes up. I think the word evil uh, can also mean like calamity or harmful and that kind of idea. <clears throat> um, what's it mean? What's going on here? Is this the Lord just being like a an evil puppet master playing with people's lives? Forcing them to be a certain way and doing it and then pretending like it's their fault? Is that, what, is that what's going on? I think if you... Um, hold the sovereignty of God to such a degree and in such a way that steamrolls steamrollers over human responsibility, then I think you are left up with, well, everything is just the Lord and we have no part to play and it's all, we're just puppets of him. Whatever whim he fancies, that's the tune that we dance to. That's more like Satan. <laughs> That's what Satan does. Um, I think the context to understand how the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him is that what had Saul done? He had rejected the word of the Lord and he continued to harden his heart to the Lord and he had grieved the spirit and the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. But I think, I, I believe, he could have repented, which would have looked like him taking the crown off his head, handing it back to Samuel and saying, fine, I, I, I'll lose the crown, but let me keep the Lord. And I think the spirit would have stayed with him. I believe that's what would have been. Like if there was true repentance and true faith, then he would have lost the throne, but kept his salvation. Um, but... As he didn't, as he hardened his heart, like Pharaoh did, then the Lord responds to that. There were consequences. And the spirit was taken from him. And this harmful, evil spirit 
were sent to, to torment him. And even in that, there's a mercy. <clears throat> because if this world <clears throat> was all peaches and roses, whilst God, God was angry at sin, and people need to be saved from sin, then we would have an argument on Judgment Day to say, well, how were we supposed to know that you were angry with us? How were we supposed to know that we needed to be forgiven? Because everything was fine, wasn't it? But in showing that there is, <laughs> there are consequences to this broken world, in this broken world of like the, the evil within us, it shows that there is a problem. There is a problem and God has the solution. And so even this judgment from the Lord to Saul, however awful it sounds, there's a mercy within it to show that he's on the wrong path. It's a mercy for the Lord to make the path to hell difficult. Right. <clears throat> Verse 15, Saul's attendant said to him, See, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord command his servants here to search for someone who can play the lyre. He will play when the evil spirit from God comes on you and you will feel better. So all they should have done is asked, why? <laughs> if they knew that this evil spirit was from God, that's quite a statement, isn't it? stretching our theology but instead they're looking for yeah music and music is powerful music is a gift from god and it can yeah it can reach within us and it can stir us and it can help us and all this but um it can certainly become an idol i see something in, in it here um, instead of turning to the Lord, like if the Spirit is from the Lord, then go to the Lord for help, for mercy. But instead, they just try to put a sticking plaster on this gaping open wound of Saul's re rebellion. So Saul said to his attendants, find someone who plays well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered, I've seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. The lyre is like a, a lute or a, a guitar type thing, a stringed instrument. He is a brave man and a warrior. He speaks well and is a fine looking man and the Lord is with him. Then Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David who is with the sheep. So Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them with his son David to Saul. David came to Saul and entered his service. Saul liked him very much, and David became one of his armour bearers. Then Saul sent word to Jesse, saying, Allow David to remain in my service, for I am pleased with him. Whenever the Spirit from God came on Saul, David would take up his lyre and play. Then relief would come to Saul. He would feel better, and the evil spirit would leave him. So yeah, we see something of the power of music there, don't we? But... It's not a patch on the peace of God in Christ. And seeming coincidences going on here, aren't there? All the while we know there is there is a God working out his purposes behind the scenes. Not in a sneaky, evil way, but in a way to ultimately bless the whole world. And a way which would be a blessing to Saul as well, if we'd only submit to it. Right, we're going to leave it there for now. Thanks for joining me. Pray that it's a blessing to you, and I'll see you again soon.